Hello and welcome to Talk Wildlife and yet another Skype interview. Hopefully soon I'll be able to do a lot more in the field. Um, today I have with me Ellie Culver, who is the Conservation Officer for England and Wales from the British Dragonfly Society. Hi Ellie, how are you? Hi, very well, thanks. Thanks for having us. And you're up there in what looks like, given the light in the room, sunny Shropshire. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, Staff just in Staffordshire, yeah, just across the border. Yeah, it's lovely here. Good weather for dragonflies. Excellent, yeah. And have you been able to get out at all? Have you had any in, in your garden? Oh, I don't have a garden, sadly. I've got an allotment, um, so fingers crossed I'll uh, get a few visiting there. But um, we have a little stream near our house um, and I've seen some beautiful and banded demoiselle there um, over the bank holiday weekend. So oh, it's starting it. to heat up now. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I, I've had a really slow start. Apart from my patches just over the road here, uh, I've got a common over the road. 70% uh, of it's been built on now, but I've still got a little remnant of it. And I got my first broad boarded uh, chases on there. I had a brainstorming um, <laughs> on there a uh, week before last. I actually got some good photographs of them as well, which I'm really pleased no. with. Nice, yeah, they're a good species because they actually sit still. <laughs> so. They do, yeah, yeah. And when you're as bad at photography as I am, you need them to sit still. So, same. I mean, like, if you go on Flickr, there's like so many people who have like amazing, like, in flight shots of like hawkers, and I just don't have the patience. I don't know how people do it. Yeah, I, I just sort of take a snap, and if it works, it works. Yeah. <laughs> right, so first of all, I think let's just give a background to the society, um, just so people know of it. And then what we'll do is, on this interview, I think we'll talk about the citizen science projects you've got. And then I know that there's the Dragonfly Hotspots project that you've started, so we'll do a separate interview on that at some stage. So yeah, if, if we can start off, if you give us a background to the society itself. Sure. Um, so British Dragonfly Society, um, we kind of cover all of Britain um, and uh, our main role is running the um, national recording scheme uh, for dragonflies. So it's all about kind of getting um, volunteers out there and recording dragonflies and that all goes into um, a freely available uh, database. Um, which can be accessed on iRecord or NBN Atlas. And then that data is really useful because then that's used to um, monitor dragonflies, um, see how different species um, are doing. And it's also used by um, kind of uh, councils and, uh, and um, other organizations um, when it comes to kind of planning and development, um, make sure that um, <clears throat> development activities um, don't um, hurt any um, rare or endangered species or their habitat. And we're also, um, apart from recording, um, we also do a lot of kind of outreach engagement work, trying to educate people about dragonflies and how special they are, um, and also um, ensure that um, endangered species um, kind of get the conservation action that they need. Uh, so rare species like the southern damsel fly and white faced data. So thanks for that. But um, so the society itself, is it? Is it actually got a base somewhere? Is it, you know, has it got reserves? Has it, you know, where is it actually based? Um, we don't really have a base. Um, so our staff are all scattered about. Um, and um, but what we have is a network of county dragonfly recorders. Um, so each county um, has a, a recorder who kind of oversees the recording um, in that area. Um, so when all the records come in, uh, they're the ones that kind of filter through them and make sure there are no anomalies coming through, any wacky sightings. Um, and we also have trustees and other volunteers kind of scattered around and they all kind of work um, independently um, to run kind of field course meetings, um, training courses and other kind of engagement events. So we're very much a, a volunteer led charity. Yeah, and I know through um through sort of reading your website and obviously getting your brilliant um, magazine and, and journal from being a membership, from being a member, really good, really good. Um, I don't know why I keep talking over there. You, you think that people are over there, but they're not over there. You're over here. So yeah, <laughs> become a member is great. Um, 
so yeah, I know that uh, you, you're setting up this project, Dragonfly Hotspots, which will make a, um, a separate interview. And so that obviously that will give you a number of sort of partner type bases. So as I say, we will cover that again, but from this point of view, you've mentioned volunteers. Volunteers are clearly extremely important to you as they are for a lot of conservation organisations. And you rely a lot on sort of citizen science type projects. So what I'd like to do is just touch on a few of them, um, starting off with the big one, which is Dragonfly Watch. So can you explain to us what Dragonfly Watch is um, and roughly how people can take part in it and then how they can find out a bit more and then, you know, they'll be able to maybe get involved in that because it is a great project. Sure. So Dragonfly Watch is really kind of our main kind of ruckus coding scheme and all the data from that goes into and towards BDS publications. Um, so we had our 2014 Dragonfly Atlas, um, which maps the distribution of all UK species. Um, and we are currently working on the state of Dragonflies 2020, um, which is going to be an update of that because because of climate change and kind of human activities, um, Dragonfly um, distribution is it, of what well, the distribution of different species is kind of changing quite rapidly. We're seeing a lot of new species kind of coming over from the continent. Um, so that really means that we have to kind of update um, the maps quite regularly. Um, fingers crossed it'll still be done for this year. Um, obviously the lockdowns kind of um, put a bit of a spanner in the works, but hopefully that'll be out. Um, but basically any data, any sightings um, that people submit to the BDS recording scheme um, that goes towards um, our atlases. Um, but um, the main activity of Dragonfly Watch is called um, adopt a site. Um, so basically this involves um, visiting um, a local wetland, uh, one of your local wetlands um, three times um, throughout the dragonfly season. Um, so that's May to September and doing a very simple species list. Um, so just listing all the species that you can see. So this is a great activity for people who um, are familiar with kind of common species, but are wanting to kind of learn a bit more and learn to kind of identify new species. Um, and obviously, if you wanted to take part in this um, activity, sunny days are the best days to see dragonflies. So that's when we ask people to go out and complete the survey. Um, and you can register your um, site that you want to adopt by going to the Dragonfly Watch um, section of the BDS website um, under recording. Excellent. And, and you mentioned their training and, you know, clearly there might be a lot of people that have um, because of lockdown and because they, they couldn't sort of go far, started looking at dragonflies a little bit more, um, maybe noticing them in the garden stuff. So what level of people, first of all, are you looking for to participate in Dragonfly Watch? You know, you know how, how experienced should they be? Um, and for those that don't feel they are as experienced as that, what kind of training is there? What, how can they get some help? Um, so any like if um, you're just a beginner and you're just starting to, um, to learn about dragonflies, um, I mean, any sighting, any records that you um, send into the BDS goes towards um, our, um, our publications. So any records that you send in are valuable. Um, for a doctor site, and um, that's probably kind of a, a, a mid-level range. You kind of you're familiar with kind of more common species, and you're just kind of getting to grips with the the the, the more unusual species. Um, and for people who are wanting to learn more about dragonflies um, and identify dragonflies, um, we have a um, identification tool um, on the BDS website that we're currently developing. Um, we have um, a we have pages for each species. Um, most of them have um, identification videos as well. And at the moment, our chairman has been very hard at work and um, working on uh, producing um, guides to dragonflies um, in your garden um, for kind of each season. Um, so we've just produced um, the one for June and July, um, and that's available on the BDS website um, under the news section. Great, great. Well, what I'll do is obviously under the uh, under this interview, I'll put links to various pages on your site uh, and then you know, people can get involved in that because 
you know, it, it, dragonflies are amazing anyway, so you should be watching them. But if you can record them at the same time, all the better. So let's talk about a couple of projects that you've got open at the moment that are about individual species. Um, number one is the white leg damselfly. So first of all, can you start off by telling us sort of roughly where you could find a white leg dragonfly? And I'm not taking it down to sort of actual habitat, but you know, from your atlas, which I have got, and then it's upstairs, I should have brought it down, I could have <laughs> had a question myself. Um, yeah, so give us an idea of sort of white leg damselfly, whereabouts is it, is it you know, because I know the next one I'm going to talk about northern damselfly has got a specific region, mm -hmm. but what about white legged? So white leg damselfly, um, that's a species that you can see in England and Wales. Um, sadly, Scotland misses out on this one. For now, you know, with climate change, you never know. It might be up there at some point in the future. Um, but um, south of England, um, middle England, um, as far north as Derbyshire and Stafford, um, I'm Staffordshire, um, I'm like right on the tip of the um, the species um, distribution, um, so it's a bit harder for me to find the species. And um, basically, as far west as Powys, um, unfortunately, Norfolk does miss out on this one, but they have enough other species. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, don't want to be um, pleased. I know. <laughs> um, and all while it's not, um, it can be occasionally seen in quite a high abundance. Generally, it's. Um, quite, it's not a particularly common species, um, so while it does have quite a wide distribution, it's not often seen um, in kind of in large numbers, apart from the occasional um, instance when you get kind of um, a big swarm of them. And what's the objective of this particular piece of citizen science? What is it you're trying to achieve? Um, so white-legged damselfly, this is a species that um, our county dragonfly recorders raised some concerns about. Um, it appears to be um, disappearing from some of its um, historic strongholds um, and but at the same time unfortunately it's um, an underrecorded species um, and we're not quite sure whether that's just because it's um, it lives along rivers and um, rivers aren't always the most exciting places to go dragonfly watching so our volunteers often go to kind of more exciting um, kind of ponds and lakes to record dragonflies um, so all, what we're doing with this project is to try and kind of increase the kind of the profile of the species to get people looking out for it and basically update our distribution maps um, to try and work out what's really going on uh, with the species and is it in decline uh, within its um, current distribution. Right, okay. And I mean, that's great. Yeah, I live in Norfolk, so I'll have to travel. To find <laughs> so we'll have to wait for the lockdown. Yeah, to be yeah. It is one that I haven't seen yet. I have seen one that we're going to talk about in a minute, um, but before we do that, I haven't seen a northern damselfly either, and for good reason. So first of all, what's the range of the northern damselfly? So the northern damselfly um, is uh, just a highland species. Um, it's right at its um, most southerly range um, within the UK. Um, so unfortunately, and if you live um, up in Scotland near the highlands, um, you're unlikely to see this one. Yeah, I will uh, one day go look. <laughs> it's on my list too. <laughs> yeah. So again, you know what what what's this project about? What you what are you trying to sort of glean from this particular project? So again, this is a, a species that's um, under recorded. Um, this is partly because um, it's often mistaken for more common species that share its um, its its habitat, uh, such as the common blue damselfly or the azure damselfly, which you can often see um, just in garden ponds um, and streams. Um, they're very widespread species, um, but also because it's a highland species, so often they're inhabiting areas that are not visited um, regularly by the public, so they often get overlooked. Mm -hmm. So really, we're just we're again we're trying to kind of identify what's really going on with the species distribution. Is it more widespread um, than we think, or is it um, on the, the, the on the decline? In which case, we need to um, kind of put in kind of um, more safeguards for the species. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so so that's two projects that are open. So there's Dragonfly, Dragonfly Watch, and then there's the White Legged and the Northern Dragonfly. Mm -hmm. um, the next one I want to talk about is your club tail research and that's closed now and you do have some findings from that so it'd be great if you could share some of the findings uh, on the club tail. I know that one of the hotspots is the River Dee in Chester or around Chester because I've seen them there and photographed them there thank goodness. Well, um, 
<laughs> so yeah, yeah, very, very lucky. Um, so yeah, so I got them there. So give us a little bit of um, a background about sort of the project and then some of the findings. Sure. Um, so the common club tail is a river species. Um, it only breeds on kind of slow flowing lowland rivers um, and it's quite an elusive species. When you see it, it's, it's quite catching. It's um, a kind of a medium sized um, black dragonfly with yellowy green stripes. Um, so when you see it, it's like there's nothing else like it um, kind of living on rivers in the UK. Um, but the problem is that as an adult, it spends most of its time up in the woodlands, um, up in woodland areas, um, away from its breeding ground. Um, so it's very hard to kind of see a map as an adult, which means, again, it's a, an under-recorded species. Um, but it's also a species that's known to be um, very um, sensitive to issues such as um, water quality, um, disturbance um, on rivers, um, such as dredging. Um, so there were concerns that the species was um, potentially on decline, but we just didn't have the data to know kind of where its existing populations were and where it was declining. So the aim of the club tail count project was to update our distribution maps uh, for the species. Um, and to get around the issue of not being able to find it as an adult, we got um, volunteers to look along uh, riverbanks uh, looking for exuvia, which are the shed larval exoskeletons that are left behind when the aquatic larva um, turn into an adult. So the larva will crawl out of the water onto the riverbank or onto some vegetation, uh, shed its larval skin and fly away, uh, leaving the um, exuvia behind and those can be collected. Um, and thankfully the common club tail um, exuvia is really obvious and easy to identify because it's got a really flat squat body and this weird kind of pointy head. Um, so it was quite fun. Volunteers really enjoyed it. Um, it was kind of like a weird treasure hunt. Um, so we ended up having oof, um, almost 200 volunteers who walked over 200 miles of riverbanks um, out between 2017 and 2019 um, looking for the species um, along their local rivers. Um, and this is a species that can be seen, it, which um, emerges in June through to July. Um, and I think between them, they found almost, they recorded um, almost 2,000. Um, so that's either, that was mostly um, exuvia finds, um, which they collected. Um, and then from that, we kind of plotted um, the distribution of their records and compared it to historic records. Um, and it was really quite interesting kind of the, the, the changes um, that we'd seen. Um, so some rivers were doing really well. Um, like you said, the, the River Dee uh, has a really strong population. Um, and if you go to Holt, uh, Holt Castle um, on the, river D, the banks of the River Dee, you can see a giant common club tail um, sculpture that's um, been installed. Um, which is really impressive. I need to get up there and, and have a look at it. Um, uh, near me, um, the River Severn, all the way up the River Severn and um, past uh, Shrewsbury, um, population's doing really well there. Um, but there were some um, quite concerning um, findings as well. Uh, for example, uh, the River D, uh, the common club tail, what used to be found um, along the River Avon, but we only got one sighting from the River Avon uh, within the three years. Um, and also, no dragonfly, no common club tail were found on the River Kennet, and also the distribution of common club tail on the Thames seem, seems to have become quite restricted. Um, however, there is still quite a good population um, near the River Goring if you're down that way and want to see them. Right. Okay. And what you've touched on there is something that um, I know in the next interview we're going to talk about dragonfly hotspots, but I, mm. I think what we'll also do is we'll talk about. Um, basic conservation of dragonflies and how they're doing uh, yeah. because obviously you, you've painted a picture there of the club tail it'd be interesting just to get an overview of some of the other species um, and some of the sort of the new ones and some of the ones that are str struggling a bit yeah. uh, I know things like the willow emerald uh, sort of coming to the country and doing quite well so yeah, yeah we'll, we'll cover that in the next so before we end this one though just a very quick question for you because I was involved in this particular um project very loosely uh, mm -hmm. it sounded really grand I was involved <laughs> so yeah and I did very little but carry buckets and stuff like that but um all important the... work <laughs> yeah uh so the re-release of the white-faced data into Delamere Forest um 
I worked on that with Vicky and then with Chris and then moved to Norfolk. So never really saw any sort of, well, any any white-faced data in, in Delamate for a start. So how, how's that gone? How, how's it going? Um, so good. the good news is um, that the species is now breeding, is now a breeding population, um, and that was confirmed last year. Um, they managed to find um, some exuvia of white-faced um, data um, within the pool where they were released. Um, so it's now gotten to the point in time where we know that these, the adults that are emerging aren't the species that were introduced. These are the species, uh, these were individuals um, that um, uh, developed from eggs laid uh, from the introduced individuals and have developed as larvae um, within the pool um, in Delamere and have emerged and successfully completed their life cycle um, within within the pools within Delamere. So that's really good news. Um, numbers, unfortunately, were very low last year, um, partly just because it was a really, really wet and cold um, May, which is kind of their main um, emergence period. And then numbers of dragonflies in general were very low last year in Delamere Forest. Um, but that's not to say that next year they won't back, bounce back. Um, insect numbers always kind of fluctuate quite rapid, um, quite um, significantly. Um, that's just the way they are. So fingers crossed next if we get some kind of, um, it's been quite nice weather this um, May, so fingers crossed if the volunteers have been able to get out and um, survey them, then we'll um, we'll have a, um, an increase in numbers. Um, but the volunteers there are doing an amazing job. Um, I have seen the pictures and looking for the dragonfly exuvia, it doesn't look like a, a fun experience, kind of wading through the sphagnum um, in your waders. It looks like a, quite a, a a difficult task um, which you probably experienced <laughs> um, and um, also they're doing um, quite a lot of um, habitat um, enhancement work for them as well so cutting back trees around um, the breeding pool uh, to increase um, kind of the sunlight coming into the uh, the breeding area because uh, dragonflies love sunbathing they love warm conditions um, and they've also been cutting rides through the trees to try and connect other potential breeding pools so hopefully the species will kind of spread and create a network of populations within um, within the forest area which would kind of mimic um, the, the populations you see up in Scotland um, within the forests up there. Excellent and I must must make a point of getting back up there at some stage to see them. Yeah totally. <laughs> have to plan it in. Um, yeah, definitely, because um, I know that when I was working with Vicky, uh, I'd moved and I was still in touch with her. And the first one she saw got eaten by a sparrow. So <laughs> that one go down to you now. <laughs> but hopefully since then, you know, the, the numbers have picked up. So that's great. So what we've done is we've concentrated on sort of your citizen science projects for this interview. Uh, in the next one, we'll talk about um, dragonfly hotspots in particular, uh, but we'll also talk a little bit about sort of some of the sort of conservation issues surrounding dragonflies and, that, and how, generally how they're doing. You mentioned the sort of fluctuation in numbers um, so they can bounce back, but we'll talk about that and what potential threats there might be and various other things, I'm sure, because I always go off on a tangent uh, in the next interview. But for now, that, that was really great. It's, uh, you know, the the people that get involved in citizen science, you know, you, you can't underestimate, you know, them and the volunteers. They do fantastic work and a lot of conservation organisations couldn't survive without them. Um, so thank you to them and thank you to you for your time. Ah, oh, no problem. <laughs> All right, Lee, I'll speak Thanks to you Thanks very again. much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.